Tonight, a Democracy 2022 campaign special, the final televised debate before Michigan's primary election, live from the campus of Oakland University in Rochester. We are joined by five Republican candidates vying to be Michigan's next governor. Tudor Dixon, Ryan Kelly, Ralph Rebant, Kevin Rinke, and Garrett Sedano. From the UP to the thumb, and here in Metro Detroit, this debate is airing live in every corner of the state. Proudly sponsored by WXYZ Channel 7 in Detroit, WXMI Fox 17 in Grand Rapids, WSYM Fox 47 in Lansing, and the Michigan GOP. One hour dedicated to getting voters answers they deserve. This debate starts right now. Right now. Good evening, I'm Chuck Stokes, and thank you for watching us from wherever you are this evening. <laughs> Candidates, thank you for joining us. We know how busy your schedules are crisscrossing our state, so we appreciate you accepting our invitations. I'm teamed up tonight by my fellow Scripps Media co-moderators. To my far left, Doug Reardon of Fox 17 in Grand Rapids, the west side of the state. He is their political reporter, and in the middle, Elle Myers, she is with Fox 47 in our capital city, Lansing. She is also a political reporter, and I'm with WXYZ. A few housekeeping rules that we'll go over very quickly. There will be no opening statements from the candidates. The candidates will have one minute to respond to questions posed to them by the moderators. They will have 30 seconds for rebuttals. Each candidate is allowed up to three rebuttals. You don't have to take them all, but you have three at your discretion. And they will have one minute closing statements that we will make sure that we reserve time for them to utilize them. We should say that the order of the questioning and the order in which they are standing at the podiums was decided a few days ago in a random draw with representatives of the candidates. All right, without further ado, let's get started with what we all came here for. Doug, you have the first question for candidate Ryan Kelly. I do. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, candidates, again, for your time. As you know, the theme of tonight's debate is pure Michigan, and perhaps nothing is more Michigan than our lakes and our waterways. Uh, but not everyone in Michigan has access to clean and safe drinking water. Uh, for instance, in Benton Harbor and still in Flint, people are dealing with lead issues. And for many, many years now, even decades, a lot of Michiganders have been drinking dangerous PFAS chemicals linked to cancer. So the first question for you tonight, and you have 60 seconds to answer it, starting with you, Mr. Kelly, is how do you ensure the Michiganders, all of them, have access to clean and safe drinking water? After we saw the Benton Harbor crisis that happened, my campaign made a statement that when I'm elected governor, within that first year, I want every municipal water supply, whether it's a city, a township, to provide us with the age of their infrastructure, with the age of their water treatment plant, and then their most recent uh, uh, report for the water quality that they've had, that would be for the year 2022, and we want that by the beginning of 2023. That way we can prioritize across the state which cities, municipal water supplies need to be addressed and be repaired and what we saw happen last year, Governor Whitmer, she gave millions of dollars to cities that did not need to have the repairs made. I looked at all those water quality reports and I noticed that those cities didn't have any lead issues, but we still had Flint, we still had Benton Arbor and other areas. So I wanna see those water quality reports, that way we can prioritize Thank all you, of Mr. the Kelly. different- Thank you, Mr. Kelly. That is your time, I appreciate your answer. Mr. Soldano? Yeah, every single Michigander should be able to drink clean drinking water. Um, not only in Benton Harbor and um, Flint, but also with the increased testing that they're doing now. We're going to find out there's probably a lot of other cities that infected water too, and these people should not be drinking lead-filled water. And so it comes down to infrastructure. It comes down to money going into that infrastructure. And that's why if you look at Florida right now, they have $22 billion surplus. South Dakota reported a huge surplus. 
instead of having an enormous amount of money, which we should have because this governor um, didn't handle the pandemic the right way with the lockdowns, with putting our kids in a mental health crisis, with canceling their experiences, opportunities, and dreams, we don't have the excess of money that we should have if she would have handled it the right way. So bottom line, we need to get the money to these places and we need to invest heavily into our infrastructure and make sure all of our future generations have clean drinking water. Thank you. Mr. Rickey. Yeah, we have to look at the state of Michigan's lead levels and compare those to the federal lead levels. And lead is in our water, as our PFAS. So we need to prioritize. We know that Benton Harbor was roughly twice the amount of lead that Flint had, and it was ignored by this administration for a period of time. With the COVID money that came back in, I'm disappointed that our legislature and our governor didn't mandate that those funds were directed to fixing the problems in Benton Harbor, fixing the problems in Flint. The key element, because there is going to be lead in water across the state, is that we start to address PFAS, which we realize now are significant cancer causers, and that can be corrected at the same time as we reduce our lead levels to below federal standards. All right, thank you. Ms. Dixon? Yeah, water is our greatest resource here in the state of Michigan. There should be no child and no adult that goes with some sort of water that is unsafe in the state of Michigan. But we have to have reports. We have to read reports across the state. I know you mentioned Flint and you mentioned Benton Harbor. As I've traveled across the state of Michigan, I've heard concerns in the Upper Peninsula. I've heard concerns in northern Michigan. We need to get reports from across the state and make sure we're taking those seriously. And then make sure that that money is allocated to those communities. Our communities know what they need best and they need to be figuring out exactly how they can spend that money to make sure that every person in Michigan is drinking clean water because like I said, it's our greatest resource and no one should go without. And Mr. Rabin. Yes, as everyone said, it's important that we drink uh, clean water and uh, those tests are available at any hardware store. And so what I would recommend is that as citizens, uh, we purchase that at our home level because that's the most important what's coming into our house. And then we will give folks a rebate on that from their taxes as they purchase those. But you know, it's most important that we look at the older ones, as was mentioned, that we look at uh, some of these cities that have mishandled their funds and they've ignored the importance of uh, doing this very testing. And so as I uh, am governor, I want to have uh, an all out assault because we seem to be having a pandemic of, of water issues right now in Michigan. I wanna have a monthly report coming from our cities to make sure that we have fresh water for everyone in our state. It's, it's critically important. And of course, uh, we can't do without fresh water. All right, thank you for your answer, Shell. All right, candidate, let's talk a little bit about education. I know you all have touched on critical race theory. Um, it looks like critical race theory is not being taught in Michigan. There are no plans to have it taught in Michigan according to the Michigan Department of Education. So how would you as governor to guide schools to teach about diverse populations, race, and racism here in Michigan. Candidate Kelly, you'll start. I get to go first again. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. So uh, that's an absolute false statement that you made in regard to <clears throat> critical race theory not being taught in schools. That was something that was decided at the State Board of Education, as well as FOIA requests that came from the Novi School District that said that, in fact, yes, they are teaching critical race theory. Now, day number one with Governor Kelly, we will sign an executive directive to terminate all of the DEI positions in all of our state schools because it violates Article 1, Section 26 of the Michigan Constitution. And we even see now with this parents council that the current governor is aiming to put together, she has these different groups, but not different political affiliations. So it's not diverse and it's not inclusive, which is a very sad thing. American history as American history has played out over the generations, does teach all those different aspects of culture and diversity. That's what I learned growing up, and we need to get back to American history. And so your baseless claims of it not being taught in schools is absolutely inaccurate. Okay, candidate. We reached out to the Department of Education, but Mr. Soldano, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I don't trust them. And I heard Bethy DeVos wants to get rid of the Department of Education. CRT is being taught in these schools. I don't care what they say. And we all know that CRT is a fundamental racist belief system fueled in the faulty ideas of Marxism. Along with CRT, they're also teaching gender and sexual theory, which is quite comical because you can't talk about sexuality in the workplace because that's sexual harassment. But they're saying that it's deemed essential 
to these kids. Get back to the basics. If you want to teach my kid anything critical, critical math, critical science, critical reading, you can teach my kid how to critically think, but you have no right to teach my kid what to think. And that is why, as Michigan's next governor, we will be banning CRT, we will be banning sexual and gender theory, and also what we're going to throw on top of that is banning diversity, equity, and inclusion training. That is what we're going to bring to the table. Teach the history, the right history. Quit confusing our kids, because back when I went to school, the only stress that you had going to school was worrying about whether or not your friends were going to be in your class. We have to quit putting gasoline on the fire okay. of the mental health Candidate, crisis thank in you our very kids. much. Um, I'd like to give you another 20 seconds. I don't think you answered the question of how you'd like to guide schools to teach about those issues. Well, it's really you easy to teach the right history. That's what you do. You teach the right history, all the history. We have scars in America. We do. We don't erase those scars. Those scars are here to teach. So we talk about the civil rights movement. We talk about the Michigan Free Derisers. We talk about John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. and the Jim Crow laws. You teach them the right history. And I don't know about you, but since I was Excellent. little to now, Thank you, candidate. it's I getting appreciate better. It. Great. All right, candidate Rinky, your turn. I don't know what they call it in Michigan, but CRT or forms of it have been taught. It's been acknowledged that it was a college course and it has filtered its way down through K-12 and lower. And it's wrong. I think the first thing though is we relate to education and we have record spending on education in the state of Michigan that we need to address is literacy. We have an epidemic of illiteracy in our kids. Roughly 50% of the students in public schools in Michigan are considered illiterate when you look at their reading level proficiency. And we can't teach anything to our children if they can't read. There's no writing, there's no arithmetic, and in fact, it makes it even more difficult to diagnose them for mental health issues. The ability to communicate and to read is critical, and that's the first step that I'm going to take as governor, is to bring up our reading literacy to over 90%. Thank you, candidate. Ms. Dixon. Well, the Department of Ed maybe should talk to Detroit Public Schools because their superintendent was quoted as saying, we are deeply using CRT in our schools. So he is obviously coming out and saying this is absolutely being taught. And when he came out and said that, I reached out to a Detroit Public School teacher and I said, explain to me what you're seeing in the classroom and why we have nearly 90% of our kids failing their literacy exams in Detroit. And he offered up to me, I, I didn't ask him about the CRT, he offered up to me, our kids feel like they have no opportunity. CRT is being deeply used in our Detroit public schools. And these kids are being told that they're being held back. They don't have the opportunity. I would like them to see an accurate history of what's happened in the United States, the good and the bad. I want them to know exactly what happened and highlight the people that have done great things so that they know they can do great things too. Hard work is is a wonderful way to achieve, but also empowering our students to know that they can do hard work is important. Thank you, candidate. All right, Mr. Rebrandt, your turn. Yes, uh, I was at the Farmington Public School uh, Board meeting uh, at the beginning of this year when they addressed this very issue. And Farmington Public School is being applauded for being the first to come out with this, uh, I think it was called a 30-day challenge so that the kids would go home and uh, deal with these issues to try to find out their white privilege and all these other things so that they could better get along with each other. But it's really against what Dr. Martin Luther King was teaching. He said we shouldn't be judged by the color of our skin, whether we're white or black, but by the content of our character. And I'm convinced that these types of things, CRT, SEL, are nothing more than indoctrination of our children. And what they do is they teach our kids to hate each other. They teach our kids to look for uh, ways that they can just uh, force uh, this stuff that's been forced down their throats. So I'm not only going against the transgender, or the, the, the CRT, but I'm looking to remove transgender teachings and furry days, and uh, we need to get rid of sex ed and bring back health class because we gotta <coughs> go you, from candidate. indoctrination Thank you, and thank education. you all for your perspectives. We'll toss it over to Doug now, or Chuck, Chuck. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, all right. Um, candidates, many people believe that gun violence in America has reached absolute epidemic proportion. Michigan has not escaped these tragedies. We've seen it with our police officers, we've seen it in our schools, and we've seen it in our streets. If elected governor, what will you do from your bully pulpit to take steps to make sure that AR-15 assault style type of weapons are not getting in the hands of people who should not have them 
and would you be in favor of increasing mental health funding from the state budget? Mr. Keller. I get to go first again. This is exciting. Well, this, is, this, this is the order that <laughs> so you all So first of all, we have to understand that assault is an action, and it's not an object. So to say that these are assault weapons, uh, they, they just sit there unless somebody else assaults someone with them. So we need to get away with these baseless claims of these being assault weapons, first and foremost. Uh, second of all, uh, we need to respect the fact that the Second Amendment in our Article I, Section 6 of the Michigan Constitution is something that is being demonized and criminalized instead of being embraced so that our culture understands how to best handle firearms. We don't see that happening in our schools, and we see the continued school shootings with zero type of ideas on how to actually protect our students. I'm working with the NRA, the School Shield program, so we can identify vulnerable areas in our schools to protect our schools. We need to uphold Article 1, Section 6, and also the government is most of the time the problem, not the solution. We need to lean on faith-based communities to address the mental health issues. Government should time. partner with them to make that happen. All right. Very quickly, would you agree whatever name they go by that they create a tremendous amount of harm and they are not what you use for hunting. I absolutely disagree. They, they don't do it. They sit there and they do nothing unless someone else does something with it. Assault is not an object. Assault is something someone does. You can have a, an assault podium right here if I were to throw it at somebody. So it's, <laughs> you, you know, we have to understand that as a society that the word assault does not mean an object. So these are not assault weapons. All right, Mr. Sedano. In, in Chuck. Look, the Second Amendment's not for hunting. Let's, let's get that perfectly clear here. The Second Amendment is to protect our First Amendment right, okay? Um, and the first thing that we're going to, to, to do as Michigan's next governor to curb gun violence is we're gonna get constitutional carry through. Because did you just see in Indiana where somebody was carrying and stopped somebody that was a threat and he stopped it within minutes, somebody who was constitutionally carrying. So that is what we're going to do. We do not have a gun problem. If we did, then states like New York and Illinois wouldn't have the problems in the gun violence they do because they have the most restrictive gun laws. And look at the horrible, evil person did in New York when them shot up that horrible grocery store or the grocery store with those people. And then if you, I call it shot Chicago, not Chicago, they have the most mass shootings in any other city in the United States. So obviously gun restrictions do not work. We have a mental health crisis, like you said, but we need to get constitutional carry in so we can be armed and prevent these things. But also we need to put a lot of money into mental health crisis and the ultimate why, which is governors who have created this mental health crisis. Very quickly, the second part of that question was, would you increase funding for mental health? Yes. All right, very good. All right, Mr. Rinke, same question. Yeah, I, I'm a constitutional carry guy and it is right in our founding document. It's non-negotiable. And that is the right for citizens to protect themselves against tyrannical government. An AR-15 rifle that you refer to functions exactly the same as a pistol. So to outlaw a gun the way it looks, then it would make sense to outlaw a car the way it looks using that rationale. We have bad people. And Michigan actually holds the distinction of having the greatest public attack in the history of our country in Bath, Michigan, north of Lansing, when someone who was angry and mad planted explosives and blew up a school with kids in it. It's the greatest loss of childhood life. Bad people do bad things. And yes, Chuck, we will spend more money on mental health to fix and identify those potential. All right, thank you. Ms. Dixon. Perks. I think we are definitely going through a mental health crisis right now, especially after a pandemic, when people were ruled by fear. We have to look at how policies were handled in states where everything was shut down and people were told that you have to go turn your neighbor in. I remember a story when I had a, a friend whose neighbor was an elderly woman she had someone come and mow her lawn and they turned her into the police. Fear causes mental health issues. We have fear in schools. We have fear in government. This is something that we have to stop. We have to come back with a positive attitude and show people that they're safe and they live in a great country. And yes, I think we need to look at funding. We saw that we would have had a 200 bed hospital in Cairo, but that was reduced to a 100 bed mental health hospital in Cairo. We need to look at that and make sure we have the facilities necessary, necessary to treat mental health. All right, Mr. Reban. 
Chuck, it's a great question. Uh, I'll start out by saying I don't agree with the phrase gun violence, but I will tell you that as a, as a, as a pastor and as a police chaplain, the, Detroit, uh, the Michigan Chiefs of Police, Southeastern Chiefs have endorsed me. Uh, what, what I would share with you is this. I went to the Oxford vigils. Uh, I went to all four visitations for those four students who lost their lives. As a police chaplain, I've seen needless death. And so this is more than just an academic question for me. This is an issue of the heart, and it's an issue that is very close to me because I've seen everything that I don't want to see. But I will tell you that many of the shooters have been on psychotropic drugs to help them through their mental issues, and then they miss what reality is. And so I'm coming back to the mental issue stuff because we're so quick to dispense drugs to people just to get them off of our table, get them out of our sight, and have them sit as zombies in a room, and the net result is they, they lose sense of reality. So yes, I would fund uh, mental health, uh, it, um, uh, it, increasing mental health in the budget. All right, you don't like the term gun violence. What would you just call it? One, one word, just <clears throat> violence? I would call it people violence. People violence, all right, very good. Doug? All right, candidates, this next question is in the vein of education, albeit early childhood education. There was a recent study that showed the cost of daycare and childhood care in here in Michigan is almost equal to the cost of a college education. I have friends and colleagues, and I'm sure you do as well, who are putting their kids on wait lists even before they have their child. The cost of education for young children is too high here in Michigan. How do you, at, at the same time, make sure that families both have access to early childhood education and also can afford it? Candidate Kelly, we'll start with you. Again, this is the order that we drew in. All right, very good. Uh, early childhood education is extremely important. My wife and I, we have six children, and our youngest is now just over three months old. Uh, we homeschool all of our children, and so we have uh, a different lens that we look through, uh, but not all families are in that same situation. And being able to provide the money following the student here in the state of Michigan is extremely important for parents to be able to have those options. We saw the recent Supreme Court ruling out of Maine that allows the dollars of the state dollars to follow to religious education, the money to be invested in the student. If we have that type of legislation here in the state of Michigan, parents will be able to draw more options for their students, be able to use those funds to allocate towards whether the education they want. I believe when it looks at the, the childhood care, we need to be looking at partnering with the private sector, with corporations, to give them enhanced benefits for providing that type of care for their employees. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Soldano, same question, and keep in mind we're talking about early childhood education and daycare. Yeah, it's, it's critical. Um, I think we are 32nd in the nation in reading right now, and they're starting to tie in job competitiveness and education, or to job competitiveness to educational outcomes, which is obviously a concern. And we have to make sure that money that we're putting into these schools is actually trickling down to the student. That's what we have to make sure of. And another thing that we're dealing with right now is inflation, is the economy. So on average, these parents are just getting hammered with on average paying 300 to $600 more per month just for groceries and everything else. So everybody's already cut thin and everybody's trying to do everything they can to survive here and our kids are, are suffering because of it. So we have to make sure that this money is not only trickling down to the kids, but this money is following those kids. So when these parents choose on what school to take these kids to, um, that money's gonna follow. That's going to create more competitiveness within our schools, and that's how another way that we're going to take back our schools. But bottom line, we have to do everything we can to help our youth. All right, Mr. Rinke? The children are the customer, and we've not recognized that in the state of Michigan. If we had the city of Detroit third grade reading proficiency levels wouldn't be that 85% of those kids can't read. And yet we continue to throw money at the problem when we know how to deal with literacy. We need to educate our kids, we need to measure that education process, and we need to start in kindergarten, come back in third grade, come back in sixth grade, come back in ninth grade, come back in twelfth grade, to make sure that those kids never fall behind from a literacy perspective. Once we start to have effective education, we can look at the curriculum and we can start to generate learning in our children that benefits the children as well as our society. Very quickly, because again, the question was paying and bringing down the cost of early childhood care. I'll give you another 15 seconds to say specifically how you plan to bring down the cost of early childhood education. What we need to do is get rid of the regulations that our state currently has regarding child care facilities that restrict and drive up costs. 
because of all of the insurances that are required, the supervision, the inspections, et cetera, et cetera, several cities add on to those costs, and it makes it prohibitive. But our kids, obviously, are funded in their education. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Dixon, the, bringing down the cost of early childhood education, improving access, how do you do it? Yeah, I know this problem well because I have four children, and we did have to find a preschool, and it's a challenge to do that in the state. And the answer is different in different areas of the state. So I think we need to understand that when you're in northern Michigan or when you're in the Upper Peninsula, it is harder for those folks to even find a center, let alone pay for a center. So how can we encourage people to go up there? And that's something we have to get creative about, about how we help these people to open their daycare centers and help them get licensed and help them go through the process and cut the red tape to make sure they're there. But also, let's look at our urban communities as well and say, what can we do within our public school system? And what can we do within our private sector as well? Because we have plenty of businesses there. We'd like to create a family-friendly Michigan. What kind of incentives can we give to companies to be family friendly and when I'm talking about family friendly I mean child care and I mean health care and I mean family leave as well thank you and finally mr. Rubin you know there's the old phrase the hand that rocks the cradle rocks the world and I may be different from everybody here but I think the best child care and the best teaching opportunities are parents who are able to say uh, keep one parent at home <clears throat> And I don't think it's the government's job to uh, give money to people to keep, uh, to put their kids in a daycare. I think it's government's job to make it uh, affordable for a parent to stay home. So I have a great plan to cut the budget, uh, really slash the budget, because by slashing the budget, we're going to slash taxes. By slashing taxes, we're going to enable parents to be able to uh, send their, uh, to, for one parent to stay home and to make it uh, that decision. Because, friends, we will never fix the state unless we fix the city. We'll never fix the city unless we fix the neighborhood. We will never fix the neighborhood unless we fix the family. So we have to look at the hand who rocks the cradle, and it's got to be the parents. Thank you, candidates. Elle? All right, candidates. We're going to take a slightly different approach to the abortion discussion. So according to the Michigan Adoption Resource Exchange, there are more than 3,000 children in Michigan that are awaiting permanent homes. They have no one basically except for the state. So how will you work to reduce that number and prevent it from rising if abortion becomes fully illegal in Michigan? Starting with you, Kenny Kelly. It's a great question, and definitely with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the decisions coming back to the state, going to be a very discussed topic this election cycle. If you watch, or if you look at my 100 day plan on my website, you will see that we have the People's Cabinet. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like. I am working with a large group of parents in the foster system and looking to adopt so we can understand the roadblocks and the difficulties in regard to having foster children in the homes and then being able to adopt children. It's very difficult to adopt, to adopt children here in the state of Michigan. We're going to work to put things in place to make it easier for parents to adopt children and find the right homes. It is something that is uh, you know, going to be a, a continued uh, issue that we have to deal with unless we get this corrected. Right now, there are so many parents out there that want to adopt children. So working with people that are actually going through the system now to identify the areas that need to have solution-oriented uh, processes put in place, uh, then working with the legislature to get those put into law. Thank you, candidate. All right, Mr. Soldano. My mom was adopted. And so this is very personal to me. And like a lot of departments and agencies in the state of Michigan, we need to make sure that we're looking at everything to make them better. We need to start putting more in emphasis on pregnancy crisis centers. We need to put more emphasis on reforming the adoption um, and foster care systems. And we have to make sure that these women are supported who decide to give birth, right, that are going through this, that they have medical insurance, that they have support, that they understand and know that their baby is loved, that their baby is going to be cared for, and that th when they give them up for adoption, that baby is going to be also cared for. So we have to do everything that we can to help these women and these children that go into the foster care um, and the adoption centers. All right. Mr. Rinky. I have several friends that have adopted multiple children. And I'm sorry to tell you that they went to Russia, they went to China, they went to Africa. And we talk about children in America that are sitting at ho in, in homes and, and can't be adopted while we are sending adoptive parents to foreign countries because it is easier, it is more accessible, and 
we need to look at the regulations. We need to look at the rules and the laws that make it so difficult for an American family to walk into an American adoption center and make a match with the child and provide for them. When my wife and I struggled to have our third child, we actually were going to adopt. And it was very, very difficult. We were looking at going overseas to adopt because that was faster and a better solution Thank you, candidate. than what Michigan offered. Thank you. All right, Ms. Dixon, you're up. Well, I hope you'll ask Gretchen Whitmer the same question because she just vetoed quite a lot of funding for adoption in the latest budget. So she vetoed grants for adoptive parents. That would help us to reduce that number of 3,000 kids. That would help families find the child that they're looking for and children find their forever home. But Gretchen Whitmer doesn't want that. She also vetoed safe homes for pregnant women. So even pregnant women who are scared and maybe looking for that answer, she vetoed that. So we should ask her what she thinks about where these children will end up. She also vetoed funding for pregnancy centers. You know why? Because they talk about adoption. So maybe we should ask Gretchen Whitmer what she will do for the 3,000 children and the mothers who would like to give up their babies for adoption and the parents who so desperately would like a baby. Because she has, made, she has vetoed all of these programs. In fact, even education for these women who might need to find out about adoption. Ms. Dixon, I, would you, um, can you talk a little bit about what you would do as governor? And then I, I see your re rebuttal. Go ahead, you got 20 seconds. Yes, we've talked about a family-friendly Michigan. We want to have these pregnancy centers available to women so that they know their options and also so that they know that they can either keep their baby or they can safely find a home for people who would love to have their baby, but also so that they can get the care that they need. And if they need a safe home, we're, of course, we want our women out there to be safe. We want this to be a family-friendly state. Family's you, number one. Thank you. All right, I see your rebuttal. Uh, we shouldn't be asking what the current governor is going to be doing uh, because she's done after this election cycle. We need to know the solutions that we're going to be bringing, and that's why when I discussed my solutions that are applicable to the parents that are looking to have adoption access and foster access now, uh, the solutions come from the Republican side of the aisle because obviously this, uh, this current governor is done after the November election, everything that she's done to our state. So Thank you, candidate. bring solutions to Thank her. you. Okay. Um, Mr. Rebrandt. Yes, this is a special uh, question uh, because on the abortion issue, uh, Father Frank Pavone and Abby Johnson have both endorsed me. But on the is issue of adoption, this is really a special topic for me for several reasons. One, our son and daughter-in-law adopted two African-American girls. And uh, they, they adopted them when they were one year old or just under one. And uh, now they're uh, 10 years old. They're just beautiful young ladies. And in our church, we've had people that have adopted children. They've waited in line to get children. So I don't mean to be uh, disagreeing with the number of 3,000, but I, we have people at our church that are eager and anxious to adopt. And the reason why is because adoption really reflects what God's love is for us. He takes people from every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue, and he brings us into his family. And that, that beautiful picture is what will transform the society once we get that, that support in the news out. So I would do whatever it takes to make adoption much easier than what it is. Okay, thank you candidates. All right. uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk jobs business a little bit here. Uh, this is sort of a two-pronged question, uh, whether I'm talking to Brian Kelly, former Lieutenant Governor, now over a small business association, or Sandy Barua, leader of the Detroit Regional Chamber. They're quick to say small business is the backbone of America. What would you do to remove the major roadblocks as you see them for small business in this state? And if elected governor, would you use the power that you have to increase, keep the level the way it is, or decrease the amount of money used to promote tourism in this state? Mr. Kelly. Tourism is extremely important. Our natural resources are incredible here in the state of Michigan and need to be uh, fully utilized, not only from the DNR side, to manage <clears throat> things better and create an environment where people will want to come to the state of Michigan for hunting, for 
coming and visiting our Great Lakes, absolutely promote more tourism. In regard to jobs and businesses, absolutely small business and mid-sized businesses are the backbone of our economy. All this corporate welfare that we see paying hundreds of millions of dollars to these big companies to come here and set up shop, that puts all of our eggs in one basket. We need to provide an environment with energy first and foremost. I'm big on nuclear energy so that we can have abundant and reliable electricity for businesses and be able to lower the corporate income tax, be able to reduce regulations so that businesses can operate, get rid of all of these corporate income, or uh, these, um, these, these COVID restrictions. Um, and then Kevin too, uh, let's talk a little bit about business with you, with your lawsuits. We'd really like to know how you're going Time. to battle Gretchen Whitmer with those. All right, you may want to be able to have that in your rebuttal. Mr. Ring? Mr. Soldano? Yep, Mr. Soldano, yeah. I'm okay. sorry. Making I apologize. Sure. All right, you'll know my name by the end of it, that's for sure. <laughs> I know Look, that. um, number one, I call it the trifecta. We're competing with the Governor DeSantis of Florida, the Abbots of Texas, Tennessee, which has taken 11,000 of our jobs with Kentucky and Tennessee. But if you look to those three states, Florida has tourism. Holy cow, can Michigan lead the way with tourism? What better state to come here year-round so we can compete with Florida with tourism? Texas has big oil, right? We have the largest storage capacity for natural gas. We need to start investing into long-term energy-dense solutions. And if we have the investment into natural gas and nuclear here in the future, then we're competing with the Texases of the world. In, in Tennessee, business friendly, right? They have low regulations. So we need to cut regulations in the state of Michigan. Also, we have to make sure that no governor can ever weaponize the health department because who in their right mind would want to come back in the next cold and flu season to open up a business? I have 30 more seconds. It went over. Okay? We have to cut regulations. We have to cut corporate taxes. And we have to invest in a long-term energy-dense solution. But we have to make sure that no governor can ever do this again because 3,000 restaurants have shut down permanently because of the draconian unconstitutional lockdowns of this governor. And as governor, I will make sure I do everything I just told right. everyone that I was going to do. All right. All right, Mr. Rinke. Our business environment, we need to recognize that our business environment is not conducive for people to come to Michigan currently. And it's a byproduct of taxes, it's a byproduct of regulations, it's a byproduct of our educational system failing our kids to provide workers, it's a byproduct of people trying to defund the police and not having safe neighborhoods for businesses and families to move to. I take an approach in creating an environment for everyone to be successful, and that's why I propose eliminating the personal income tax. Nine states didn't have it. If Michigan doesn't have it, how, what would that do for Michigan? All nine of those states grew during COVID economically and in population, while Michigan lost 16,000 people. If we create the proper environment for people to come to our state with the beautiful beautiful opportunities that we have for sports, we will grow businesses and identify future businesses that will benefit our state. All right, very good. Ms. Dixon. Well, I've already proposed a 40% reduction in our regulation by 2024. We have a very over-regulated state. It's very hard to do business with. In fact, the bureaucracy of our state is actually going after our small businesses right now. And no matter where I go, I'm told, this is a gotcha state. We're sick of being here. And it's true. We need to be a gotcha back state instead of a gotcha state. Our small businesses have expanded outside of the state of Michigan. And the reason they tell me is that the other states, they want to they want to be in the race with them. These people aren't making money unless they're producing, and they're not producing unless they can start up quickly. It's it's hard to start a business here in Michigan. It's hard to break ground. It's hard to get permits. It's hard to open up. In other states, it's easier. They want us to be in the race with them. And a Tudor Dixon administration will be in the race with our small businesses, helping them to thrive. Mr. Reba. I've been a small business owner uh, in my past history, and I've employed people. And I know what it's like to uh, develop mission statements, vision statements, budgets, and things like that. But the biggest thing that we have to look at when it comes to uh, creating uh, an environment for business is the fact that we have so much government overreach and everybody I'm talking to around the state, whether they're farmers, whether they're uh, party store owners, or whether they're dentists, is that we have too much administrative state. And, and those, those administrative state, whether it's OSHA, or whether it's um, uh, the health department, those groups have strangled our small businesses. So my goal in my first uh, six, uh, six months is to have a thousand administrative state employees retire. So we don't have to deal with so much and we won't uh, hire them back. We're going to have them retire so that we can have a freer economy 
and less government overreach. All right, I saw a sign for two rebuttals, Mr. Sedano and then Ms. Dixon. Mrs. Dixon, you said that you wanted a 40% reduction in regulations and bureaucracy was going after our small businesses. So my question to you then is this, when this was happening two years and three months ago when Governor Whitmer was ruling unconstitutionally with her draconian lockdowns, where were you at the, the, the front with the rest of us while we were pushing back against this? I haven't seen you at any of the protests or rallies. I did not see you go out and sign or circulate the Unlock Michigan petition to take away that 1945 law. Now, I didn't see you in November of 2020, in December of 2020, when she shut down right. the restaurant to in 25% capacity. Right. Ms. Dixon. You must have missed me at Marlena's. You must have missed me out there That was in March of 2021. Speaking. All right, let's let Ms. Dixon reply. You must have missed me out there on the air also talking about this and making sure there was a national audience. But I want to talk about tourism. <laughs> I want to talk about tourism because you mentioned tourism. And yes, I think I that this is so important because if we look at the no income tax and the low income tax states, they have their guests pay for their people not to have an income tax. So we would like to invite guests to Michigan and make sure that money is going back into the pockets of Michiganders. But we have to invest in tourism and we have to make sure that people Time. are looking at the state of Michigan as a place to vacation. All right, very good. I uh, see a rebuttal from Mr. Rinke. Yeah. The, the quickest way to generate businesses in the state is to identify opportunities and to create an environment for those people to come here. It's tax, it's regulatory, and income taxes are prohibitive. You cannot argue the fact that states with no income tax were more successful and that that's an element we would be the only state in the Midwest and that would be very, very appealing for people to come to Michigan. All right, thank you very much. Duff? I got All one right. too. Yeah, go ahead, right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So, Kevin, you never addressed the fact. We, we definitely want to know, with the two lawsuits that you have for the companies in the early 90s that you were running, with racial slurs that were used and sexual harassment, and you settled those cases versus fighting those cases to clear your name. Oh, so, please. Whitmer is going to be using those against you. We'd really like to know how you're going to address that. And, Tudor, the reason that you weren't there is because you weren't there to fight when the fight was happening. You're stepping in the ring. You too, as well, Kevin. We need a fighter All for right. Michigan's next governor. Time. Uh, Mr. Rinke, I see Let, you. Let's address the lawsuits. Your rebuttal. I fought the lawsuits because they weren't true, they didn't define me then and they don't define who I am now. I've had hundreds of thousands of employees that have been very, very happy. But the settlement, the people who sued me got nothing. They had to sign the $5,000 stipend after suing me for three years over to their attorney and they're the ones that asked to settle and they're the ones that walked away. That's the truth, Ryan, and that's how I'm gonna fight Gretchen Whitmer with Time. it because it's a dead deal. Time. Ms. Dixon, did I see a rebuttal from you? No. No, okay, just want to make sure. All right, Doug? All right, folks, we're getting low on time, but I want to talk about bipartisanship, if we could, for a moment. No secret, there's not a lot of it here in Michigan, uh, certainly not over the last couple of years. So uh, you've all expressed your appetite to work across the aisle when the opportunity presents itself. So I'd like you to get specific, starting with you, Mr. Kelly, on which issue you think you would be most easily able to work across the aisle on. When we look at bipartisanship here in the state of Michigan, that's mostly coded in things that are good for politicians and lobbyists and not for the people. I will be working with anybody that wants to do the right constitutional thing for the people here in Michigan. Look at Public Act 21 and 22, the Auto Insurance Reform Act that was a bipartisan deal that has left so many people without the coverage that they bought and paid for. Look at all of the different things with our auto insurance that haven't changed. When we see bipartisanship being used, it's an emotional driver to think that, wow, everyone's working together in Lansing, but they're not working for the good of the people. It's an emotional driver that is not providing the results that the citizens deserve. As governor, I work with anyone that wants to do the right constitutional thing that will bring value to the citizens of Michigan in a positive direction. All right, thank you, Mr. Kelly, and I will give you another 15 seconds to, to give us again. I'd like specifics from, from all of you on sure. one issue that you think you would be able to work across the aisle on. Uh, understood. Um, education. Providing a quality education to our students 
I don't believe that there's anyone that would want to rebuke having the disastrous system that we currently have continue. I appreciate it. Mr. Soldado. Can I restart my clock? Uh, we will restart your clock. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, look, that's one thing that we're sick and tired of is the establishment on both sides of the aisle. And that's why there's so many great Americans running for all levels of office now. We are done with the establishment backed candidates. We are done with special interest and lobbyists. It's time for real Americans to stand up and represent the people. So when you're talking about working with bipartisan, hey, absolutely. You're not going to change my beliefs on pro-life, on the Second Amendment. You're not going to change my beliefs on the Constitution. But if you have a great idea on how to move our economy forward, if you have a great idea on how to make sure that these kids aren't drinking lead in their water, or if you have a great idea to cut regulations and put more money back in Michiganders' pockets by cutting taxes and doing a forensic accounting on the budget, then yeah, let's work. We need to start having conversation again, conversation from a variety of different people and experiences and backgrounds to not only move this state forward, but our country forward. All right, thank you. And Mr. Rickey, one issue you'd be able to work across the aisle on. Well, I'd like to start with the auto no fault, and I'd like to fix that for the folks who had a contract, not only with the insurance companies that they paid for based on the fees that the insurance companies set, as well as with the state of Michigan. Candidly, I'm the only candidate that's come out consistently from day one and said I was disappointed in how the Republican legislature acted and that the governor would sign such a rotten bill. Several times I am on record saying I would not have signed that bill. Those people have the right to the coverage that they paid for. The state of Michigan and the insurance industry has a $24 billion fund of the people's money that they are refusing to cover. I have a son-in-law who has to fight, who is an auto no-fault survivor, and has to fight for what is owed him. I have worked in my traumatic brain injury business and had to fight for the people that had rights and had coverage, and the insurance industry constantly was trying to block them. All right, thank you. Ms. Dixon? Well, I think it's interesting. These three guys seem to be upset about the establishment. Maybe they should define establishment and how they would actually work with this mysterious establishment that seems to be elected officials that they are so against. I will tell you, I've already worked with people that are in government. We've already sat down. I would love to sit down with people across the aisle and talk about safe cities in this state because it is so important that we are able to have safe cities for not only our communities, but for people who want to come to the state because we need to bring at least a million more people back to the state. And one of the first things they're gonna look at is safe cities. I don't think that anybody on either side of the aisle can argue that it's important that we make sure we work on that. But that's not the only issue I wanna work across the aisle on. I want to make sure that we're always bringing ideas to one another, that we come, we come back to a place where we can work together. This is the United States of America. Let's unite and let's make the best possible plan for this state so that families can thrive. Yeah, very quickly, before we get to you, Mr. Rabin, Mr. Saldana, your rebuttal. Well, my definition of established is basically your entire campaign. Um, if you look at your backed by Shirky, right, um, and he said the election wasn't stolen um, and he wanted to hold hearings to implement red flag laws, then you have the DeVos empire, the DeVos machine that's basically campaigning your entire uh, campaign. They wanted to implement the 25th Amendment against President Trump. They abandoned President Trump um, and they're backing five out of the seven opponents of Trump endorsed candidates. And so that's kind of like my definition of establishment. Time, so Mr. Saldana. are you going to endorse Matt DePerno? Time. Thank you. Uh, again, hang tight there, Mr. Rabin. Ms. Dixon. How do you explain going to that meeting? I know you lied to the Michigan people that you did not go to a meeting to try to get the DeVos support, but this is your that biggest attack against me. It was not a restaurant association. Listen, but Kevin Rinke, yeah. Kevin Rinke was there as well. So we all Ralph. we all went in individually and spoke. I don't think Ralph was there, but I know mm -hmm. you were there James and Kevin Rinke was there. I got and left you out were again. And, and both Kevin Rinke and Garrett Soldano, we're looking for support from all of those same people that now they're so angry about. Sounds like sour grapes to That's me, sir. Time. Sorry about uh, your last Mr. Soldano, Can't this is your, your final, campaign. final rebuttal. Do you want to go first or would you like me? I, yeah, I, I, Tudor, I wasn't looking for anybody's financial support. I didn't need it. I'm the candidate that's put his money where his mouth is. You wouldn't even be oh, here without the Oh, but you were the there devices. looking I, for their, the, uh, one sir, of the their time, support. I went to present myself to the Restaurant Association and for all those people to get to know me. The fact of the matter is the DeVos family owned you. You're our version of Gretchen Whitmer. You'll say like anything or do anything to get elected. And Why did you give money to Mitt Romney? Honest. Just be honest, Tudor. 
It's okay. Tell the people the truth. You're the one supporting. Uh, right. That's time. Thank you, Ken. Let's sit down and argue a little bit. I have clocked in as Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I already have you clocked in as having used your three rebuttals for the evening. I have the third one. No, I've only done two. I've only done two. I have three. We'll give you. We'll give you your time. Okay. Right now. Please. Okay. Yes, it was a restaurant association. The very restaurants that I was standing up. Um, from the very well, beginning in November and when you were doing your podcast and you were saying that you were standing up. Bottom line, I've been in the trenches with our fellow Michiganders ever since the beginning, standing up for them while you were doing your podcast, while you were sitting in the shadows the and sitting has on introduced the bleachers. You. And so here we go again with an establishment-backed politician with her lies, trying to trying to sugarcoat everything. But bottom line, you weren't there from the beginning. You were actually I there. Right, I mean, time, I'm trying to you. explain uh, if you're Ms. you, right? Oh, fair enough. We Folks, yep. we are running out of time. So, Mr. Urban, uh, we, we, we need you to answer in your minute. Yes. All right. No, well, there you won't. know, this is the very reason we won't why have time I need for to another dug. question, but we will have we will have time for your closing statements, but we will let you have your I'll rebuttal. Do my last rebuttal. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. This Rubin. is the very reason why I need to be governor because I have dealt with uh, situations like this uh, in ministry where people are at each other's throats, where uh, businesses uh, are at each other's throats, and I've had the opportunity to bring people together. So when you talk about uh, bipartisanship, I'm also looking at uh, restoring unity to our party. I really think that I'm the only candidate that can do that. And you know, when, the way I will share that will happen is when people came into our parking lot as, as a pastor, I never once asked them, never once asked people, are you Democrat or are you Republican? I was there to help them. And so that's why I'm here to help these folks Thank get you. through their issues. Thank uh, you. Final rebuttal from Mr. Kelly. Uh, Kevin, you said you put your money where your mouth is. Yes, that's true. You also had $40 million you had set up for the, um, for the general election. And hopefully that goes to whatever candidate wins. I hope you guys get behind me when I do win. Uh, but I put my actions where my mouth is. And that's one of the biggest differences, standing up throughout 2020. Look how hard these people are trying to silence me. They're not trying to silence any of the rest of you. I got arrested. I got kicked off Airbnb. They are doing everything that they can to silence That's me. That's time, I, Mr. I Kelly. Work Thank with you. My uh, we have to get to closing statements now, so I'm going to toss it back over to Chuck. Thank All you. All right. Very good. Uh, time's always our worst enemy in these type of forums, but we're appreciative of the time that we do have. It is now time for your closing statements. We absolutely promised you beforehand, as well as tonight, that you would have those. We will do that in the order that you randomly drew for a couple of days ago. And closing statements, Mr. Kelly. Michigan has a big decision to make here on August 2nd. When we look at our actions, we can look at the Mackinac Policy Conference where the four other candidates here, they went up to the island and allowed the left to segregate them from the conference that required vaccine identification cards and COVID restrictions. I said no. Stand on principle even if you stand alone, said John Adams. I will continue to stand on principle. For all of the decisions that I make will be what is guiding for the very best decision for the future of our state. My wife and I, we have six children. And we won't stand by on the sidelines and allow our country to go to ruin without putting up a fight. By my actions, I have been putting up that fight. I will continue to do that for the state of Michigan and the United States of America. Now is a very important time in our history. Michigan, on August 2nd, elect a fighter. Elect Ryan Kelly as Michigan's next governor. Okay. Well. Bottom line is we, at least most of us here, except the establishment back candidate, have the same beliefs and values. We're conservative, right? So it comes down to these three things, leadership, fundraising, and do you have the chops to go up against Governor Whitmer? And I have proven over the last two years and three months what I bring to the table, not only with leadership, with spearheading and getting Michigan's greatest asset involved and activated to get positive change throughout the state. And that was the Unlock Michigan petition that was recruiting thousands of licensed election inspectors that was helping these kids get back to schools, helping these kids get back to athletics. The list goes on and on. I'm not a career politician up here giving lip service. Bottom line, I'm the only candidate on this stage that went up against Governor Whitmer and won. I'm 1-0. And what I'm most concerned with we is we need somebody me. who's going to be focused and spearhead and do everything that they can to go up against Governor Whitmer. You're going to be battling a court case. You've put your own money into this race. How are you going to fundraise in the general? Tudor, we'll just skip it because you've been sitting on the sidelines. And Ralph, my goodness gracious, I Time. love you, brother. But I just don't think you have enough for the primary. I'm going to Mr. Rinky. All right. Mr. Rinky. We're all applying for the job of governor. And the governor's role is to run the business of the state of Michigan. And I'm the only candidate 
that has the size, the scope, the breadth of business for over 30 years. I've owned private companies that have grown in Michigan to be the largest in the state and some of the largest in the country. I've participated in two Fortune 250 companies that had significant numbers of employees. I've done it in automotive. I've done it in healthcare with my post-acute traumatic brain injury business and an autism services business. I've employed hundreds of thousands of people and we have serviced millions of customers. I know how to run the business. And I applaud these other folks. We've got a great real estate salesman. We've got the best chiropractor in the state. We've got a radio talk show host. We've got a pastor. And then you've got a choice for who can run the business. That's me, and I'll look forward to being your governor. All right. Ms. Dixon. From the beginning, I've been running a policy first campaign and I've crisscrossed the state and I've listened to you, I've learned from you and I've presented my, my, my vision for the state, my positive vision for the state. We have 25 policy goals that we plan to enact by 2025. My vision is that people in Michigan will have good careers, they'll have better schools, they'll have safe communities, they'll be able to pay their bills and they'll have safe and fair elections. I've been doing all of the work behind the scenes. I've gotten the endorsements. I have the police behind me. I have right to life. My opponents, what have they been doing? They've been talking at you. They've been puffing up their chests and they've been running a silly attack ads against me because they thought it was a popularity contest. They didn't the realize it was about serving you. All right, let's let her make a closing <laughs> statement. If you remember one thing, remember this. This year there will be an epic race between a conservative businesswoman and mom versus a far left career politician Time. and liberal birthing parent. Mr. Rebat. Citizens of Michigan, what we have just observed is what we don't need in Lansing. We need someone who knows how to solve problems. You know, we've spent $22 trillion over 60 years to try to fix Michigan, and we have more hate, we have more anger, we have more frustration, we have more suicides, more incarcerations. And we've sent people to Lansing to try to fix these problems. And they've tried to fix it with money or uh, with education. And the problem is we can't fix spiritual problems with those, those solutions. I'm running for governor because John Adams stated that our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for any other. And that's why we've seen the disintegration of the state. That's why we've seen the disintegration of the culture. And that's why we have the problems that we have today. As I said, we've already sent everybody else to Lansing. And so I would encourage you to join with us to make Michigan a lighthouse to the nation and end the Time. disaster and vote for the pastor. All right. Candidates, thank you very much for presenting all of your points of view this evening and joining us. Cole Moderators, thank you for coming over from Lansing and uh, Grand Rapids. We appreciate it. We want to thank all of our sponsors, and we want to remind you on Tuesday, August the 2nd, to get out and vote. Your vote matters. I'm Chuck Stokes. Good night. <laughs>